A young woman finds her already unstable life rocked by the presence of a rambunctious imaginary friend from childhood. This is Ryan. And this is Ashley. And this is Ruining Ruining Our Our Childhood. Childhood. A weekly podcast where we remove our childhood goggles and put on our adult bifocals, <laughs> put on our adult bifocals to rewatch and review our favorite movies from the past. Hey, sometimes it's boy bifocals. <laughs> only after what is this? Forty-five episodes. Still can't say it. You know, we're only human, man. This is true. We're still working on stuff. We're still working on improving our sound quality. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I don't know what else to say other than, hi, I'm Ashley. I'm Ryan. And this is Ruining Our Childhood, a podcast where we watch movies. The yeah. end. Okay, bye. <laughs> we watch movies uh, from our childhood and see uh, if they hold up. Yes. And hopefully they do. They do? Yeah. They don't? There's it's been, a toss-up. There's been plenty of times where they don't. Very, very true. Yes. So... This week, we're doing the 1991 classic, and I had to l- glance over at my computer because... You're like, what year did this come out? I don't even again? know what movie we're doing today, apparently. <laughs> the 1991 classic, Drop Dead Fred, which is one that I picked, mm-hmm. but also our friend Taylor also suggested that we do, and she owned it, so she gave it to us. Yes. Because we I don't own it, but I've seen it a lot. I watched it a lot as a child. Probably wasn't appropriate for a child to watch, but... I don't know the last time I saw it. It's been probably 20 years. I would say that's a good estimate for the last time I saw it as well. Yeah. So, it's going to be interesting. And I don't know why, but somehow I merged this movie and Encino Man. And I thought Fred was played by Brendan Fraser. The only thing I can say is, and if I, I bet you if I look it up, the poster for the movie mm-hmm. is incredibly similar. Okay. And I'm going to look it up right now because I'm I'm looking at my computer right now and I'm seeing the Drop Dead Fred movie poster and, or not, let me see. I feel like there was a movie poster where Brandon Fraser was upside down and... Fred is upside down in this movie poster, and I think I'm just making this up now. Maybe George of the Jungle, he was upside down? Maybe. So now we're just confusing lots of movies. Yeah. Um, But anyway, let's keep it on track. Go ahead and give us some 1991 facts. The movie was released on May 24th of 1991. It had a budget of $6.7 million, and it grossed $14.8 million dollars. Popular TV shows from 1991 include Murphy Brown, Cheers, and Home Improvement. And the number one song the week the movie came out was I Like the Way by High Five. And a couple other popular songs were Paula Abdul, Rush Rush, and EMF, Unbelievable. Nice. Yes. Rupert didn't like that. Oh, and I forgot I could give popular movies. Yeah, do that. Uh, A couple popular movies would be Hook. The Adams Family and Sleeping with the Enemy. So we've definitely done Adams Family. Mm-hmm. I feel like we were gonna do Hook at one point and then we changed our minds. I can't remember. I could do Hook. Yeah, we should. That we was should a jam. Put that on a short list. Mm-hmm. Maybe for our next week's poll. No, we already picked a movie, didn't we? Yes, we did. But the following week, we could do Hook. Yeah. Put Hook in another movie up there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Ryan. Ryan, okay. <laughs> anyway, so that was some 1991 facts. Mm-hmm. Pretty interesting. What is your first, I guess, memory of this movie? Or what do you remember from this movie that... I remember Phoebe Cates. I cannot place the person that plays Fred at all uh-huh. in my head. But I remember, like, he was quirky and over the top. And that is about it. Because I, the more I think about it, I said 20 years... I'm thinking it was 25 years at least because I didn't see this in 2000. Probably saw it in like 1995. You're doing that math. Yeah. Like you're still way younger than what you are. Exactly. You kind of forget like how long ago 20 years ago is. 
I will say that it's been just as long for me. And I also felt like Drop Dead Fred was somebody from Monty Python, and I don't think he is. Oh. So, I don't know. I had an obsession with Monty Python as a kid. Um, well, my friends did, and we even remade the Holy Grail one weekend. I don't think I knew that. I've told you that. Mm. Did you? Yes. Okay. It was really fun. Mm. Except I remember our one friend couldn't do a very good British accent, so it just sounded like a southern accent. <laughs> He's I'm, from southern England. Yeah. It was an all-female rendition of okay. Holy Grail. So she was from southern sexist. England. Yes. Well, you guys were sexist by not including boys. We were nerds. We didn't have friends that were boys in our freshman year of high school. Are you implying that a group of females that were remaking Monty Python were nerds? Yes. How dare you? Uh, good times. Uh, that is funny. So, <laughs> back to Drop Dead Fred, which has nothing to do with Monty Python, <laughs> I don't think. But I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. Probably not. Probably not. Uh, Phoebe Cates, obviously, very uh -huh. big star in the 80s. And I just remember liking this movie because just the imaginary friend aspect. Mm -hmm. Did you have any imaginary friends? I did. And for the life of me, I cannot think of his name. I know. I can't remember mine either. I almost claimed his name was Maurice, but that was Joey Tribbiani's <laughs> imaginary friend. Occupation? Space Cowboy. Oh, yes. Space Cowboy. Maurice Space Cowboy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't remember mine when I was real little. But I did slightly develop one again, and now I realize it was a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. In fourth grade, when I moved to a different school, mm -hmm. I kind of developed one because I was afraid of being alone and I didn't have any friends. Yeah. It only lasted like a month, but, you know, I sometimes get they were there for you when you needed them in your life. Definitely. I mean, as an adult, I'm still taking my college courses and I get really nervous the first day of school. Yeah. And I can only imagine I switched schools in sixth grade when we moved across the country. And I remember like the anxiety that I had put on myself about meeting new people and stuff. And I've never gotten over it. I'm still a basket case. Yeah. It's hard. When I was a kid, I moved, well, two times that were really significant or I guess three. Mm -hmm. In a small amount of time. But once I moved to the place I graduated high school from, you know, from fourth grade to twelfth grade, I was fine. But, I mean, I still had a lot of social anxiety. I still do. Yeah. But I wish I could remember them. Because I think I had two. I just remember my mom's. She was, she and hers was Eeyore and, or Igor, maybe? It was Eeyore or Igor? E Eeyore. I don't know. She's told me the story yeah, before. but she had an imaginary friend, and I don't know why, but I remember hers and not my own. I don't know. Maybe it's just something, like, we blocked out or, you know. Yeah. As you get older, your mind starts slipping away. <laughs> <laughs> or you have to cram other things in there, so. Yeah. Information has to leave for information to go in. Apparently. I think Kelly Bundy taught me that. <laughs> I'm married with children. <laughs> Good example. Mm -hmm. So... Where you can... Str oh, I guess we shouldn't skip the whole point of this podcast. Do you think it's going to hold up? I kind of went back and forth because I don't remember a lot about it. Mm -hmm. So there, I don't have parts that are in my head right now where I'm like, oh, that's not going to hold up. So I'm going to say it is going to hold up. Okay. I'm going to say the opposite, that okay. it's not going to hold up because there are a couple parts of the movie that I vividly remember thinking, oh, this guy's cheeky, but no. It's not cheeky. It's 2020. <laughs> it's not cheeky. And I'm cheeky. not going to... I won't go into detail, but we'll we'll talk about it, I'm sure, after we watch the movie, of course. There's going to be a lot of inappropriate jokes that just don't fly mm -hmm. in the world we live in now, so... Now I'm nervous about watching this. <laughs> so where you can stream this is if you have Cinemax on their Max Go app... You can watch it. If you have DirecTV, you can also watch it. And if you have Cinemax through Amazon, you can watch it there as well. I realize there is way too many streaming services out there. There is. It'll be nice when they start acquiring each other and merging. 
I yeah, kind of like Disney's kind of has, you know, Hulu, ESPN and Disney are all under the same umbrella and you can get like a nice little bundle and it's not too expensive. But I'm thinking you just brought up Cinemax. I'm like Showtime has one. HBO has one. Your channels are all really expensive to begin with. It's starting It's starting to all add up to basically be cable. Mm-hmm. But I still feel less wasteful because, like, everything's there and I can access it whenever... Access, wow, I can't talk. <laughs> everything's there and I can access it whenever I want. Whereas on cable, there's all these channels that I have no need or want to watch. None. Yeah, I agree with you. The I don't feel wasteful when I have a streaming subscription because i'm kind of limited on what i can watch i hated cable yes because we had to keep adding packages upon packages because okay i like watching sports well you got to add the sports package oh we like watching the soup well you need the entertainment package so you can have e next thing i know i have 300 channels and i watch six of them yeah the number one thing and i've said this to you before that i love about being able to buy premium channels on Hulu or YouTube is that I can go in there and I can add HBO, watch what I want to watch, and then I can cancel it on the website. I don't have to call somebody and have them try to sell me on keeping it. And yeah. that, I always hated that. I remember when we moved in the apartment, we got all of the premium channels for free for mm-hmm two months or whatever yeah and then we had to call and cancel them and it was like the worst experience i hate talking to people on the phone i hate talking to people that are trying to sell me sell me something i don't want yeah and it's very nerve-wracking and i love that i can just go online and cancel shit pretty much for everything now it's like a timeshare presentation yes they try to sell you something and tell you this is something you need in your life but if you have a reason to not have it It's like, how dare you? You're not open-minded to this. No, I just know that I don't need to be paying you $300 a month for a timeshare. Right. Sorry. And I know the last time we had HBO, when we had cable still, and I had to cancel it, I tried to do it online online chat, and they told me I had to call, and I remember I told them I was impaired and I couldn't call. (laughs) I didn't specify which impairment, so I don't feel bad about it, but I shouldn't have to call somebody physically. Though I had to do it a couple times where I would call and claim to be you. Yes. And they I would, don't They would like ask me my name people. and I would say my name was Ashley. And they'd be like, is it? <laughs> Ashley was a male's name. He was in O-Town, damn it. No, I mean, but, you know, the origins of Ashley, it is a male's name. So yeah. stop judging. There was one time where Cox rep. they didn't believe me. Yeah. And I could tell. And I was like, well, I don't give a shit. We're canceling your stupid service. I wonder if they keep a record of talk to a female at this point, And now all of a sudden I'm talking to a male, which, hello, it's 2020. Again, you don't know shit, so you can't judge. Yeah. Maybe we're a couple and we both have the same name, Ashley. Yeah. Did you ever think of that? Cox? Maybe I have laryngitis. Yeah, maybe I have a cold. We are really overthinking this. Maybe a Wolverine clawed out my jugular and now I can no longer speak on the phone and I have to use the chat function to cancel HBO. (laughs) A Wolverine clawed out your jugular. Okay. Anyway. So so we're going to go ahead and hit that. (laughs) Pausey pause. And go watch Drop Dead Fred. Okay, bye. Okay, and we're back. We just finished watching Drop Dead Fred, and now we're going to go ahead and break down our movie. Like we always do. Correct. Uh, With our categories, and the first category is called Well, Hello There, uh, where we talk about any famous, uh, recognizable actors or actresses that we forgot were in the movie, and who did you notice? The first person I totally forgot was in the movie was Tim Matheson. Mm -hmm. He played Lizzie's husband. Charlie or Charles. Mm -hmm. She calls him Charlie, but also Charles. Yeah. Depending on the scene, I guess. (laughs) And Tim Matheson has been in a lot of things. Animal House, Mm -hmm. most notably, I think, early on in his career. He was, uh, what else was he in? (laughs) Dr. Brick Tamblin? Breland. Breland. Brick Breland. Heart of Dixie. Dixie. And he uh, most recently was on Virgin River. 
playing also a small town doctor. So when I clicked on his uh, Wikipedia, because I definitely recognized him because he was uh, Van Wilder's dad. And like we said, we we just watched Heart of Dixie a couple months ago. I was blown away that his Wikipedia picture is him from when he was on Bonanza. Oh, wow. So, yeah, he's 72. I always wonder who picks the picture because there's people that have really old pictures that still work quite frequently, like yeah. him, mm-hmm. that you think there would be a, at least one from the last 10 years. He was on a popular show within the last decade. Yeah. And heart of dixie like it just ended five years ago yeah you could have used any picture from that show it's very true or, or like you said use animal house that is his most famous thing i don't know how i i didn't look to see how many episodes of bonanza he was on oh. but i just i totally forgot when he said van wilder that he was van wilder's dad and it's an episode of this podcast so mm-hmm. i totally forgot uh who was your person first person the first person I noticed was Marsha Mason, who played uh, Elizabeth's mom, and Elizabeth is B.B. Cates. Uh, she was actually, I was kind of surprised to read, nominated four times for Best Actress at the Academy Awards in the oh. 70s and 80s, and she still works. She was uh, most recently on Grace and Frankie, oh, Okay. and she was on The Middle. She looked familiar, but I thought it was maybe because I've seen this movie a lot. The little girl mm-hmm. that plays the younger version of Lizzie. Mm-hmm. I kept going, she looked really familiar, and I looked at her IMBD, and she has been acting, but yeah. she looks really different now as an adult. Too. She was on the movie you mentioned last week. What? Ghost Ship. Is that a, was that a movie you mentioned last week? No. <laughs> okay, I'm missing. I'm messing up the title, but you said it had Scarlett Johansson, and then you add Ghost World. Ghost World. <laughs> Thank you. Like, not not Ghost, Ghost Ship. Ghost? She was in Ghost World, and oh, okay. she was on the the Pretender. Okay. Yeah, because when I saw that she was on that, I was like, Ashley mentioned this last week, and I clicked on it, and I'm like, Nope, still doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just because I've seen this movie quite a bit. Mm-hmm. But my next one was Ron. Eldard, mm-hmm. I guess that's how you say his name, plays Mickey, who is a childhood friend of Lizzie's. What I recognize him um, most notably is Deep Impact, mm-hmm. and he played a paramedic on ER. Yeah. He was on like 20 episodes of ER. Yeah, he was on like the first season. Yeah. And he left ER, I believe, to go be on Men Behaving Badly, a sitcom with Rob Schneider. I remember that show. It was right after like Home Alone 2. Oh, okay. And Rob Schneider was kind of becoming a thing, and I watched it. It was it was okay. I vaguely remember that mm-hmm. sitcom. Yeah. So, who was your next one? My next one was the legendary Carrie Fisher. Yes. Who played basically Elizabeth's best friend, and obviously we all know Carrie Fisher. Carrie. We all know Carrie Fisher as Princess Leia from Star Wars, and she unfortunately passed away very recently. And I like how you looked at me like, that's what she's from? Like, you're a total jerk. I know. You're like, oh, she was Princess Leia? It I was, didn't know that. It's funny because we were talking about this movie at Trivia mm-hmm. when we were like, yeah, we should do it. I was like, I think Carrie Fisher's in it. Or am I thinking of her playing Sally's best friend in Harry when Harry met Sally, which these are two different movies, but I remember her having short hair like she had in this movie. Mm-hmm. And I think she also had the same exact haircut. For when Harry met Sally. So I was confusing the two, but... You were right on her being in it. In both of them. Yeah. So, go me. Go you. My next one was Bridget Fonda. Mm-hmm. Plays an actual... Like, has an actual cameo. Because she was pretty famous at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, she plays Annabella, which is Charlie's mistress. Uh, Charlie is Lizzie's husband. Yeah, Tim Matheson. Kate's. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very small part, but mm-hmm. I did read in the trivia that she is really good friends with B.B. Cates, and she did it as a favor. Oh. So it's like uncredited okay. cameo. Obviously knew her as Peter Fonda's daughter and uh, Jane Fonda's niece. Uh, I was surprised to see that she's married to Danny Elfman, which I didn't know. I don't know if I knew that either. Yeah. But like you said, she hasn't acted since 2002. and 2002, crazy. yeah. I used to get her confused with... um. Jennifer Jason Lee, which I think they were in that one movie where one of them, is it Single White Female? Where, like, one of them stalking the other? I think they're both in that. That sounds correct. 
I always thought they looked kind of similar, and I confused them. And Jennifer Jason Lee has been acting continuously mm-hmm. the last 20 years, so. End of story. The last one, and unfortunately I don't know really any of his movies that he was in, but he plays a huge part in this movie, which is Rick Mayall. Yeah. And he obviously plays Drop Dead Fred. Yes. Uh, you pointed out he was obviously a British actor, uh, and unfortunately it looks like he passed away uh, five and a half years ago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said in the beginning of this episode, I swear to God he was somebody from Monty Python, and I think I decided he kind of looks like Eric Idle, but when I was reading through the trivia, I actually read that when the writers were writing this movie, they actually had John Cleese in mind okay. as Fred, and then there were so many other people that they wanted to be Drop Dead Fred, too. I saw Robin Williams, and they wanted Tim Burton to direct, direct it. it yeah and they and i saw they wanted like winona Ryder to play the phoebe cates character but the writers thought she seemed too young because she was still really young at this time yeah and she's gonna be married and they even offered her the movie and she's like i don't want to be known as the weirdo girl like going in all these weird movies yeah you'd come she... off of heathers and beetlejuice and then you yeah. go into the movie like this i could see that which is honestly there's some comparisons to beetlejuice in a way like that whole end scene, mm-hmm. it re- it reminded me of something that you'd see on the set of Beetlejuice. Yeah, where it's kind of the rooms are weirdly shaped and the walls are angled weird and the doorways were. Yeah, it was like this '80s modern look, but also like dream world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I could totally see Winona Ryder playing this role. Yeah. So it's not a stretch that. Other than she was super young. So. Yeah, yeah. She would have been about 18. And like you said, she's supposed to be a married woman at this Go- point. Going through almost like a quarter life cri- yeah. crisis. Yeah, so that wouldn't add up. But yeah, something tells me they probably, a lot of their movie choices, they were like, we could get Phoebe Keats. Oh, Winona Ryder's available. We'll get her. Yeah. Do you want to move on? Yes. Or did you? Okay. No, that was it. <laughs> This next category is called Kids Would Call It a Throwback. We call it the prime of our teens, where we talk about fashion, offensive jokes, and dated references. I said it right. (laughs) Anyway, I just feel like I've been always trying to add a third category to that, or subcategory, I should say. And there's not. You're like, nope. I don't think there's ever been. (laughs) So I don't know what I'm thinking. So the fashion, early 90s. Oh, What do you think? It was some real interesting fashion choices. Yeah. Uh, Right off the bat, I noticed Elizabeth was wearing, like, tube socks, but they were pushed down tube socks. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of an interesting thing, but also very 90s. Yes. I liked her outfit in the first scene Mm -hmm. as an adult. She's wearing, like, a floral dress with a floral long sleeve shirt. Yeah. But there's two... Two different patterns of floral, by the Mm -hmm. way, and two different colors. And I was like, she's dressed really homely, but I think that's because she's supposed to seem like she's homely and almost to seem like she still dresses like a little girl. That makes sense. She looked, to me, she looked like a uh, kindergarten teacher. (laughs) Yes. But like you said, extremely homely. Yeah. And she still, like, had her hair super long, Mm -hmm. like she was a little kid, and not to say... She had a headband ribbon yes. in her hair. Yeah, it was an interesting choice. Yeah. But also, I feel like that was a wig. I think it probably was because her hair does change quite a bit throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. I know on the little girl, it seemed like her long hair was definitely a wig. Yeah, I, I thought at one point it was kind of mulleting, <laughs> yeah. would be the way I would describe it. It was heading that way. You could see where her hair, real hair actually ended mm-hmm. and what was a wig. Yeah. But obviously, spoiler alert, there's two scenes where Drop Dead Fred does cut her hair, so... Yeah. Makes sense they didn't go, oh, you have really nice long hair, young little girl? We probably should cut this off. Yeah, right. Um, Did you have any other fashion? We talked about Tim Matheson. His hair was very blown dry, blow dried, and feathered. He looked like, I don't even know if you know who he is, John Davidson. That sounds familiar. He used to host Hollywood Squares when I was a little kid. Okay. And he had some glorious feathered hair. Tim Matheson, I think, was trying to give him a run for his money in the <laughs> hair department. It was 
outstanding. It was feathered and kind of greasy at times. Yeah. So. Yeah. The other thing, it was another one of Lizzie's outfits. Towards the end of the movie, she's sitting there talking to Carrie Fisher. Mm -hmm. Or, I guess, Carrie Fisher is running. And she's kind of running with her. And she has the biggest shoulder pads. Yes. I can't talk today. I'm like, biggest shoulder pads. (laughs) And it's amazing when Carrie Fisher's working out. She has a cigarette in her hand the entire time. That is some early 90s working out right there. I don't know. I remember my mom wanted to pick up smoking again. She had quit for a couple years. And she found this picture of herself from the early 90s where she was looked really fit. Mm-hmm. And she had a cigarette in her hand. So I, I swear to God, my mom was like, I'm going to pick up smoking again. Because I was way skinnier when I was smoking. Oh, man. I just remember when I was like 13 or 14 going, what? Does that make sense, Mom? I think the amount of shows that I watched in the 80s and 90s where there was somebody that picked up a smoking habit and they would use that justification of, look at how good I look. Yeah. I'm in such good shape because I smoke. No. No. (laughs) No, that's not why you're in good shape. That could be seen as a dated reference in a way, too, so. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of dated references or offensive jokes, did you have anything? There was a ton of dated furnishings, and right off the bat was uh, when Elizabeth's mom goes to pick her up to take her home after she finds out, like, Charles is having an affair. Yeah. She packs a suitcase for her, and it's this cloth suitcase that you have to carry, which was very much of the time, but... Now I'm thinking, I don't know the last time I saw a suitcase that was not on wheels. That's true. We need to have wheels on everything. Yeah, make it easy. That thing can be heavy. Yeah. Think about it. You go to the airport, you're allowed up to 50 pounds in a suitcase. You're supposed to carry that from the car into the airport? Ugh, no. So much easier wheeling that shit. Uh, that's funny. There was just a creepy thing that... Murray, who plays Janie, Carrie Fisher's boss slash... Lover. Lover. They're at the houseboat, uh, Janie's houseboat, and they're, she's talking to Lizzie about Drop Dead Fred, which, by the way, great friend, I think, in the sense that she almost immediately believes her that she actually has an imaginary friend mm-hmm. and that she's not going crazy. Yeah. And she supports her. She embraced it. Yeah. And Marie's like, is this a girly thing you guys are talking about? I've never had imaginary friends, just wet dreams. No. Gross. And this guy is in his mid to late 50s. Yes. At least. It was gross. Yes. What's your next one? We talked about some of the furnishings. Elizabeth's mother's kitchen has woven backed chairs that I remember at Pizza Hut when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. For some reason, that's what I associate those chairs with. Her cabinets in the kitchen, they were beige, but they had white knobs and white handles on them. So they looked really gross. I don't know why everyone was obsessed with beige. I don't know. It was a big thing. Yeah. I guess we'll probably have the same reaction to stuff that we see in movies, say, in 2020. Mm Mm-hmm. In, like, 20 years, I'm sure we're going to be like, why did why were we obsessed with all of this? In 2030, when we've entered our 10th season of ruining our childhood, <laughs> and we've started to review movies that came out this year, we'll be like, what the heck were we thinking? Yeah. And then Bill will be like, people, go back and listen to that Drop Dead Fred episode and listen to us bad mouth stuff from the 90s. Ugh. Whenever I think of the 90s, I think of my parents' living room. When we lived in California when I was a kid and it was all pink Mm -hmm. or peach and also Southwest. And yeah, just super. Now I think about it. It was super dated. We were the same way. We didn't do peach, but it was Southwest. Yeah. I don't know why. My parents went through two Southwest phases. Mm -hmm. So. And they still have some of that stuff, I believe. But it's not. It doesn't punch you in the face by any means when you walk into, like, their 
family room, I guess you would call it. Yeah, I feel like my parents update fairly regularly, so. They definitely do. They keep on top of it, which I think is a big thing is I grew up in a house where my parents were like, it's really expensive to update your furnishings and stuff. So they would buy nice stuff that was expensive. But then I felt like we had it around the house for almost 20 years. Yeah. But it was, we can't get rid of it. It was friggin' pricey. Yeah, that's true. Plus, they just made furniture better back in the day, where I feel like now they don't. Even if, even oh stuff God. that's super expensive is not really made to the highest quality. I will never forget carrying a couch with my friend Brian that my parent, my aunt and uncle gave it to my parents, and we were carrying it through the backyard because it wouldn't fit through the front door. And I remember Brian joking around with my uncle going, could you remove the sacks of lead before you give it to us? <laughs> Because it weighed, like, a good 300 pounds. It yeah. It was so heavy, but like you said, they made furniture good back then. Yeah. This has been Furniture Talk with Ashley and Ryan. Next week, we're going to have Nick Offerman come on and talk about milling furniture. That would be awesome. That would be we're amazing. Not. I don't want to disappoint our Can you imagine listeners. if we could swing that? Ron Swanson come on and talk about making a chair. It's not going to happen. It would be amazing. Anyway. Sorry, guys. Shall we get back to the movie podcast? <laughs> yes. I put this in offensive jokes and data references, more because I was offended by it. But if you've never seen this movie, Lizzie, with the exception of Carrie Fisher's character, surrounds herself with the worst people. Her mom is maybe not the worst mom on television. I'm sure there's more. But she is the worst. (laughs) I'm just going to keep saying worst. At one point, she tells her child, the child version of Lizzie, that sometimes I don't think I love you as much as I used to. Yes. Because she spilled cereal. Mm-hmm. Actually, she didn't even spill that cereal. It was her dad. Her dad knocked it over. Yeah. And it was a total accident. Yeah. But it was just the worst line because I'm like, who says that to a child? Yeah. Honestly. And then she was not there for her daughter at all. She wanted her to get back with her husband who had just had an affair. Mm-hmm. Basically, so she didn't have to take care of herself, but then when she wanted her to stay with her, it was because so she could control her. Yeah. So, but... Yeah, no, her her mom was awful. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have anything else in this category? One last thing that I had was when Elizabeth and Charles do get back together, they're in bed and they he can hear some noises And he goes out and he actually hits, like, a nurse in the face with, like, a cast iron pan. But when they were in bed, they had this, I don't know how you would describe it, they look like the lights that you would see in a bar that advertises, like, a beer company. Oh, okay, yeah. But it was this panther light. It was, like, (laughs) six feet wide, and it was an outline of a panther, and it was above their bed. You know why? Because he works at a Jaguar dealership. Makes more sense. That's Wasn't a panther. That's how big of a douchebag he is. He puts a logo of Jaguar in his bedroom that he shares with his wife. I did not put those together. I didn't either until you just started explaining it. I'm like, that's why. And he had above his fireplace, it was this weird piece of car artwork where it was like two headlights and a license plate and the front of a car coming out of the wall. And now it all makes sense. Yeah. Like, he's a total car douche. And he is so domineering, too, mm-hmm. like her mother, where he manipulates her all the time to the point where in the very first scene where she's talking to him, she's making a point to go to him. You find out that he had an affair with this woman, but she wants to go to him and say, I want to work this out because I love you. Mm-hmm. And he just keeps interrupting her and kind of almost making her feel like she needs to apologize for the fact that he cheated on her. In the beginning of the movie, she's so, um, she's such a push pushover that she almost like agrees to it in a way. I guess it is my fault that you cheated on me. He was the quintessential late 80s, early 90s douchebag husband. Yes. Ugh. It goes with the, I think we kind of discussed it on the Wedding Planner episode, mm-hmm. where in movies when they're clearly with the wrong person and the person that they had chosen to be with is the worst and it makes me question the character of the main character 
Like, how did you choose this person? Yeah. But with at least with her though, I feel like she has no self confidence. She's very mousy. She so she kind of just took what she could get in a way. Yeah. But then I look at her. I'm like, you're fucking Phoebe Cates. <laughs> you're really pretty. Yeah. It doesn't match up in a way, but it's always funny when it's a character that every teenage boy had a fantasy about Phoebe Cates growing up at yes. some point. And they do this thing where they're like, well, we'll make her look frumpy. But you're like, but she's still Phoebe Cates. Yeah. No, I, I kind of thought, I know we discussed her fashion and how she dressed like a school teacher. It kind of went in and out of my head while we were watching the movie, but it reminded me of how they were, they try to dress down people when they're going to court mm -hmm. to make them look more innocent. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, Jody Arias. Yes. Who is... Obviously, people should know who Jodi Arias is, I would assume, if, if you like murder. Mm -hmm. And if you're from Arizona, it's a very famous Arizona murder. And we can't re recommend enough going and watching the Lifetime movie, Jodi Arias. Dirty Little Secret. Yes. And uh, you will know exactly what we're talking about. And if you're if you're a fans of My Favorite Murder and you heard the Phoenix live show, they used <laughs> that Lifetime movie as... Part of their research, which was really funny. It was Karen Kilgariff's main source she, of like, information about the Jodi Arias murder was a Lifetime movie. Yeah, she's like, Jodi Arias, dirty little secret. Amazing. Uh, anyway, we're really getting off some tangents Yes, today. we are. That's okay. Yeah. That's good. It's going to be a two-hour episode. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, do you want to move on? Yes. Go ahead. Our next category is we're going to go ahead and call our best friend from a phone booth. And talk about some technology. Yeah. What pieces of technology did you notice? Well, that definitely was the first. Mm -hmm. And it was in the very beginning of the movie. Just so you understand how much bad luck Lizzie has, she parks her car, calls her friend on the phone booth to tell her that... Was it after she tried to talk to Charles or before? I think no, it was it, after. It was before. No, no, you are right. You're right. It was after. she followed him in the car. Yeah, it was. She's telling her friend, like, hey, it didn't work. I tried to get Charles back, and he didn't want to listen to me. Which, why does she have to chase after him when he's the one that fucked up, right? He should definitely have been the apology, but he's so narcissistic. Yes. And he doesn't give a there, crap. There's some verbal abuse going on there. Mm -hmm. um, if we want to get deep in this movie. But she is on the phone with her friend, and somebody breaks into her car and steals her purse mm -hmm. and then literally a minute later another guy comes up and steals her car yes and then she's late for work because she was on her lunch hour and then she gets fired from her job as a court reporter that has got to be the worst two hours in the history of someone's life yeah try to get back your cheating husband car gets stolen broken into purse stolen get fired from your job in a matter of yeah, two hours. Yeah, no wonder she starts seeing her imaginary friend again. Yeah. She definitely needs the help. Exactly. Um, what was some technology you saw? Uh, one of the things I noticed, and it was when she was in the phone booth and you see her car parked, I noticed newspaper machines. Oh, okay. Which I do think they're still around, but they are not as prevalent and as popular as what they were. No, like you I could agree. walk up to a corner and throw your fifty cents in a machine, get a newspaper. I'll, next time we're out and about, I'll have to kind of keep my eye open because I don't know the last time I saw one. I've seen obviously like the grocery store still sells yeah. the Sunday paper. I don't even know if they do. They even make a weekly newspaper. I do know for a fact in Ohio they've reduced the days and it's not daily anymore. It's like every other day the main Cleveland newspaper comes out. That's, Which is insane. It's insane, but also we have everything on our phone, so. Boom. I get it. There, At one point, her mom takes her to get her hair cut, and at the salon, there's a computer screen, and I'm using air quotes because it looked like a TV. It did look like a TV. And it had pictures of Phoebe Kate with different hairstyles, hair mm -hmm. which I think is funny because there's like an app you can do that on. Yeah. But... It, it looked really cheesy, it did. obviously. Go figure. 1991. You bring up a good point, because I think about when I needed glasses a couple months ago, 
the way you can buy glasses nowadays is you take a picture of yourself and they superimpose the different frames onto your face and you buy glasses on an app. That's true. On Sephora, you can try different shades of lipstick and makeup. Nice. I don't know how accurate it is, but... I get it. It's something. It's crazy, like, you can do that, but also, like, they explored it in this and boy, did they... It was cheesy and bad. It was. One of the things I noticed was when... There's a scene where Elizabeth goes over and basically attacks a violin player (laughs) with a violin. And security takes her into an office and her mom has to come get her out. But what I noticed in the security office, they had like an old computer, which makes sense. But they had a time clock where you would, you know, clock in and out of work on the wall. Oh. And it was massive. I feel like you have an eagle eye. There's times where I don't notice scenery because mm-hmm. I'm I'm paying attention to the dialogue, and then you'll be like, "Didn't you see this?" And I'm like, "What? Are you? No." It's hard because I do find myself looking at scenery and background stuff because none of this stuff really played a huge part in the no. movie, with the exception of the phone booth, I guess. So they they don't really feature it. Like there wasn't somebody clocking in and out, but I'll be like, "Oh yeah, I remember that." Yeah. So then, yeah. I don't know. It's just funny that you can notice stuff like that. And then you'll be like, hey, did you notice this part? And I was like, I didn't notice it. I was too busy noticing the glass table. (laughs) They used animation, or I mean, I guess special effects, not animation, special effects Mm -hmm. to do unnecessary things, I felt like. I think it was funny, Mm -hmm. but it just kind of dated the movie when she would sneeze and Fred would go flying around the room. And, like, bounce like a basketball, basically. Yeah. In the end scene, they used a lot, like, when she imagined a tree in the middle of the staircase Mm -hmm. so they could get up the stairs, which I don't, I don't understand that. It was just stairs. They couldn't walk up the stairs. And anyway, (laughs) sorry, it just popped in my head. But it was really cheesy because it's 1991 and I know they probably didn't have a huge special effects budget. No. So it's very grainy and not great. No, and... It didn't add anything to the movie. No. And it was unnecessary. I could have totally done without it. For sure. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. But at one point they did surprisingly not use special effects. They're in the kitchen and he smashes his face Mm -hmm. um, into the fridge. Or her mom closes the door on his head. And it's smashed and it's obviously makeup. Yeah. looks cheesy, but it doesn't look as bad as if they would have used some sort of special effects. That's very true. Yeah. Didn't look too bad. No. Did you have anything else? No, that was it for me. What about music or anything like that? None of the songs jumped out at me. I don't know that there was a lot of them in there, but I did notice they would use some saxophone to cut between scenes. Yeah. And it it wasn't as bad as Lethal Weapon, (laughs) but it was... Heading in that direction. I honestly didn't notice it until the very end when she's driving from Charles's house, or her house, I should say. Yeah. Her apartment. After she basically tells him it's over to go to her mom. Mm-hmm. And it's really heavy. Yeah. And I don't know what our obsession was with jazz sex. We love some jazz and sex. And it makes me wonder what noise effect in today's movies and TV are we going to think is cringy in a decade or so you know i don't know why movies find it necessary though like it's just a change in scene you don't have to play music well i mean you can play music because obviously musical scores do help the watcher or viewer know what emotions to feel yeah but i feel like in the 90s they're just like just add really loud sax (laughs) it'll be fine (laughs) hit him with some sax boom No need to feel emotion. She's driving a car. Cars don't make noises. Just go ahead and hit them with some sacks. (laughs) That car is silent. (laughs) There's Uh, no blowing trees outside or anything like that. Or a babbling brook. Hit them with some sacks. It overpowers it almost. It does. Because you're like, whoa, jazz sacks. And we've gotten away from the annoying jazz sacks. So then it now it dates it. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think a lot of movies nowadays are looking for like subtle. I, I mean, it depends on the scene, but if yeah. it's supposed to be like a quieter scene or something, it's like subtle music. Mm-hmm. Apparently in the late 80s, early 90s, they're like, nope, nobody's talking. Loud ass music. 
I mentioned Lethal Weapon, and I saw a couple weeks ago they're developing the fifth Lethal Weapon. Yeah. And God, I hope they have some good sacks between the scenes. So, we can move on to our next category. Is it even good? Where we talk about the plot, plot holes, and we name our funniest and most cringiest moments of this movie. What did you think about the plot? I think the stuff involving Fred is really over the top, but it's also she's basically, I feel like, having kind of mental episodes. And back then, especially, I feel like people would ignore that stuff, which is what I felt all of her friends and family did. Was I just agree. ignore it. Yeah. So I do think, ironically, even though she has this over the top imaginary friend who's, you know, crazy and stuff, I still think it's kind of believable. Yeah. No, I agree. She's obviously going through a huge crisis in her life right now. Yeah. All these changes are coming and it's stressful and she doesn't know what to do because she doesn't have confidence in herself Mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to be alone because she actually says that multiple times. Yeah. She's afraid to be alone. So it does make sense that she has her imaginary friend from childhood come back to help her get through this emotional time. Yeah. I think the only person that kind of supports her and understands what's going on is Janie. Yeah. Carrie Frisch- Fisher's character. Because she's a little more in touch with her feelings and, and believes in, like, you know, trying to work on yourself mentally. Yeah. So, but I, I agree with you. Did Did you have any plot holes you wanted to discuss? Other than, I mean, it kind of goes with the plot is at one point, Elizabeth smears dog shit all over her mom's house sinks a houseboat. I mean, it's obviously Fred doing these yeah. things, but it's her. Is it? I think it, it's her. I, I would have liked to see a scene where it was showing her actually doing these things. Yeah. Because, I don't know, I guess you could take the whole thing as like a metaphor that sometimes you need to take a break mm-hmm. from yourself or that you need somebody to help you get through stuff. Yeah. But I honestly do believe they're like, no, imaginary friends are real. And she really had somebody. Okay. When I see it from that point, it kind of takes away my plot hole that I was going, she's having all these episodes because I'm going with the assumption he's not really there and this is just her doing these things. And I'm going, why isn't anyone getting you help? (laughs) Yeah. And that was going to be my plot hole. I would agree with you, except for the last scene where her now love interest, Mikey, his daughter now has an imaginary friend with the same exact name, and, you know, she knows he moved on to somebody else. I mean, that's what movies and TV and books are there for, is for your interpretation. Yeah. So. So, no, I, if you look at it the way you're describing it, I agree. Okay. I had a plot hole in the sense that I was, I'm just surprised she didn't cut the shit out of her hand when she used her phone in her childhood bedroom to break the... The window. Window. Mm-hmm. And her hand was perfectly fine. Good point. Because she basically, she uses the phone, but her whole hand goes with the phone. Yeah. I'm like, and there should be a thousand cuts <laughs> on your hands. Laceration, blood everywhere. No, nah, she's fine. It's all she's good. good. She's good. Um, did you have anything else? No, that was it. I mean, we kind of discussed why, I don't know why Lizzie would even marry Charles begin with, because he's the worst, but, so we don't need to further discuss that. We'll just move on. (laughs) What was your funniest line or moment? My favorite moment, and it cracked me up, because some of the stuff with Fred is really over the top and cheesy, but I liked when she was at the restaurant with Mickey on lunch, and it was like an Italian restaurant, and this is the one time where they would kind of show her doing stuff without Fred. Like, she goes to drink her water, and her hand starts shaking and they show you when Fred's there helping shake her and shake it. And then they cut away and he's not there. And she just pours the water on her lap. But then also she picks up her plate of food and Mickey kind of goes along with it. And he was like, Oh yeah, let's smell our food. So he lifts up the plate. And the next thing you know, like she launches her plate of food across the restaurant. She throws spaghetti at another patron. It was really funny the way. And then Mickey just went with it. No, yeah. Yeah. That scene was probably one of my favorites because it was just really funny still, I thought. Yeah. It's it's like, a, you know, a good mixture of physical comedy. Mm-hmm. Mine was... I'm trying to pick... I, I wrote down two, just in case. But 
I, I think mine was, they have flashbacks throughout this movie, obviously, from when Fred and Lizzie were, or when Lizzie was a child, and Fred was her imaginary friend. And they are playing burglars, mm-hmm. and they're putting stuff in a garbage bag, because that's their burglar bag, or whatever they said. And their burglar bag? I can't remember what they said. <laughs> Is that what they said? They might have said that, oh. but it's just a funny term. Yeah. Like, it says burglar bag. <laughs> and Lizzie picks up... I think a china pot, a teapot. Yeah. And she's like, this is very expensive. And Fred's like, we must be very careful then. And then she just drops it in the bag and you just hear crash. It was just funny the way they said it. That was literally the other one I had written down. Oh. Because I was like, that was just funny as hell when they did it. And I also liked, it was more earlier in the movie when Fred appears, Lizzie tells him that she, that he never helped her as a kid. He only ever got her in trouble. Mm Mm-hmm. And he gets mad and he runs away and he's like, goodbye forever. I hope you die horribly. <laughs> I just thought it was funny because it he, just, to me, it was kind of like British humor in a way. And he was so sassy yeah. about it. Yeah. I hope you die horribly. Uh, what was your cringiest liner moment? There was the scenes like a lot of it at points gave me anxiety. Like I mentioned when he, uh, Fred and is tracking dog poop all over the living room. I'm like, oh God. But hands down, the cringiest moment was when Charles and Elizabeth have kind of gotten back together a little bit, and they're starting to make out, and she starts having kind of an episode, and he forces her to take a pill, like literally like forces it into her mouth. And I'm like, holy crap, this guy's going to kill her by overdose at some point. Yeah. He does seem like the person that would murder his wife so he could be with his mistress. Yes. You know? So... What was yours? Well, I definitely put the dog poop thing up there pretty high because that's it's the funny part about watching something as an adult mm-hmm. is you start thinking of, man, that's going to be a bitch to clean. And yeah, her mom's a bitch, but man, that sucks. <laughs> and I was also thinking like, he's going to have to clean his shoes later. I stepped in dog poop as a kid. It was the worst to clean off of your shoes. You're an imaginary friend. I, but I'm, that's what I'm thinking. It was when Charles was on the phone with his mistress, Annabella, and he's trying to tell her, like, I'm not actually taking my wife back. I got her under control. And he says, I'm your fella, Annabella. No. Yes. Gross. Yes. So it was just cheesy. Uh, But it fit with his character mm -hmm. because he sucks. Yes. Did you have any additional notes? I had a couple. Uh, We talked about earlier, I mentioned when uh, Carrie Fisher's speed walking and she's got the cigarette in her hand. Yeah. But also there's the scene where Fred and Elizabeth go to a art gallery type gala thing. Yeah. And that's where Charles is there with Annabella. But Fred's hair is so over the top in the scene. He looks like the mayor of Munchkinland from The Wizard of Oz. He does. You know what it also reminds me of is the movie poster for meet the deedles yes where they have their hair up and in like a wave yeah 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 it was but i i get the munchkin thing too because he was also wearing his green suit yeah yeah if if it yeah or he looked like he should be in oz the steve oz Mm -hmm. i was a little i i don't remember this part as a kid because i do remember the end scene where she's basically in her own imagination, literally unlocking her inner child Mm -hmm. that is taped to a bed. And, but it's the beginning scene where she has a dream that she's in her bed sleeping as a child and a hand just comes out of the pillow. I was like, that's terrifying. How did I not remember that as a child? That was my first, it wasn't cringy. But if we had a category for creepy, if I saw this at seven years old, that shit would have gave me nightmares. Yeah. I was like, holy crap. Yeah. And it kind of actually reminded me of uh, Monsters Under the Bed. Mm Mm-hmm. Or Little Monsters. Little Monsters. Little Monsters. Where it wasn't a Howie Mandel. Was it? I think it was Howie Mandel. Oh, wow. I just know Ben Savage and Fred Savage were in it. That is... Blowing my mind right now. <laughs> How did I've seen that movie so much? We almost did it for the podcast when my brother came down. Yeah, and then we changed our minds. We did a little Orange County. Yeah, a, a little Orange County. 
Yeah. I did want to talk about that mall. So this was filmed in Minneapolis. Mm Mm-hmm. And Minnesota is a big thing about malls, right? But that mall is fancy as fuck. Yeah. There was a mall like that where I grew up in Cleveland. It was downtown. And it was... As a kid, I didn't want to go to that mall because it, it there was fun. nothing for me. There wasn't a toy store in there. There wasn't, like, fun sports stores. It was like that. It was fancy Italian restaurant and a classical music concert in the middle of yeah. the mall. Yeah. I mean, I guess... Fashion Square out here could kind of be compared to that a little bit, but there's it's got a good variety. Yeah. But 20 years ago, it didn't. That's true. It was not. I mean, was, I don't I don't know, but yeah. I, I'm going to take your word for it. Yeah. But it was, yeah, it was a super nice mall. I'm like, damn. I was like, that's fancy. Mm-hmm. I think that was pretty much it, actually. Well, then are you ready to move on? Yeah. As you know, here on a Ruining Our Childhood, it is always award season. We give out two awards every week, the first of which is the valedictorian, or valedictorian to the Nicolas Cage Online School of Bad Acting. Who did you give your award to? I ended up giving it to Ron Eldard. Okay. Because, is it Mikey was his character's name? Mm-hmm. I remember watching this movie as a kid and liking him because he was kind of goofy yeah. and silly. And then I rewatching it now, I realize he's really only in like three scenes, and He's not, like, a believable love interest. Though, re-watching this movie, I realize he's really not even a love interest in a way. Because they end the movie with him just going, I want to be part of your life. And the end. They don't yeah. kiss or anything like mm-hmm. that. He just was kind of cheesy. And I, I really liked the rest of the cast. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't like the characters of the other cast. Yeah. Uh, like, they were assholes. Mm-hmm. Except for Janie. But I thought they were acted well. So... I really can't complain. I know you're probably going to be like, well, actually, this is what I picked. But it it was just because his, I thought his character was almost a little pointless. Yeah, it could have easily been removed. Yeah. But then I wouldn't have had my favorite part of the movie. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. For me, I gave my award to Tim Matheson as Charles. Okay. And I specifically noted his I'm your fella, Annabella. Which I was like, oh, God. He was everything that I hated about 80s movies. He's a total sleazeball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I liked Tim Matheson a lot. He was one of my favorite characters on Heart of Dixie, and I love him as Van Wilder's dad and Animal House. But in this, I was just like, ugh, why are you playing such a terrible character? And you have your John Davidson haircut. (laughs) Ugh. It was amazing. Yeah. He played a good car salesman, though. He did. And really brought it home with him with his Jaguar light on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess we can move on to the Thomas J. Hanks Award for Exceptional Acting. Who did you give yours to? I gave it to Phoebe Cates. I really uh, liked her character and was kind of rooting for her. I felt bad and when she was having her episodes because, like I said, I felt like it was all in her head. But she was really good yeah. in the movie. I, we kind of mentioned it earlier how... She's a beautiful woman, and she's known, one of her biggest parts is for being that girl from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Mm -hmm. and it's crazy that she plays such a mousy person, but I think she does it so well. Yeah. The way she acts, she's very quiet, almost, and just lets people just walk all over her in the beginning of the movie. But honestly, I gave it to her just because of that scene in the restaurant, because I thought it was hilarious. And she did such a good job with the miming and yeah. making it look so real. The parts where you see he's not there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it's like amazing. true acting where she is trying to push down her plate. Oops, I'm just hitting stuff. Just hit it. Push down her plate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and obviously nothing's actually holding the plate. But yeah. And when she, acting folks. the water. Yeah. Is just, yeah. It was really good. Because also, I like the water part where she just dumps it in her lap because she's making direct eye contact with Mikey. <laughs> Mickey. And she, Mickey. Mm-hmm. I keep on calling him Mikey. Mickey. And she... <laughs> I'm going to tape your hands to your armrests. You do it, too. Oh, I know. I do. Um, Yeah, She and she looks so serious. Like, nothing's going on. I'm not pouring water in my lap. <laughs> he just goes with it. Yeah. I was like, oh, we're doing that? 
cool. I'm going to throw this. Which I think is part of the reason I chose him for the Nicolas Cage Award, because I'm like, I don't know if anybody would really truly go with that. They'd be like, what the fuck is wrong with you, lady? Yeah. But, you know, I guess we're supposed to believe that he's such a nice, charismatic guy that he doesn't mind that this girl's a little cray-cray. Yeah, very true. So, I guess we can move on to answering the question, does this movie hold up to our adult standards? And what do you think? I thought it was interesting when earlier, before we went to break and then we watched the movie, I said I thought it was going to hold up. And then I looked on Wikipedia, and this movie has like a 9% on Rotten Tomatoes. And right off of that, I went, ooh, you made a mistake. This is going to be terrible. I felt like it was not a bad movie. It was funny. It was kind of uh, pulls at your heartstrings a little bit at times. Yeah. I thought it was a really enjoyable movie. I think watching it now as an adult, there's stuff I remember from being a kid watching this movie. And it was mostly the scenes of him and the child, Lizzie, just running amok. Yeah. Doing crazy shit. And I always thought that was really funny as a kid. And now rewatching it, I see what adult Lizzie is going through and how she's trying to deal with all these added stressors in her life and dealing with two of the worst people who, two of the closest people in your life, your mom and your husband, should be the biggest supporters of you. And they're the two biggest pieces of shit in the world. Yeah. And I think the movie is held up because of that kind of back message that I didn't really get as a kid. I thought it, I thought it was just funny that you know, she had to deal with this, seeing this guy again as an adult, and she's changed, and he's trying to adjust to her being an adult, and he's like, ugh, why are you an adult? That's gross. Yeah, now when you're a kid, you're like, oh, cool, they're making a mud pie, and like, just yeah. running, and, but as an adult watching it, you appreciate an entire different portion of a movie. Yeah, where he is trying to, like, get her to loosen up and be that kid that was strong, Mm -hmm. you know? So I I, I appreciate that part of the movie. There was definitely flaws in the movie that I think, and there was definitely cheesiness to the Mm -hmm. movie, but I think overall it wasn't a bad movie. It was, there's parts that are really funny and watchable, and I thought it was fine. It's one of those things when you watch it, and Phoebe Cates has definitely stepped away from Hollywood in the sense she doesn't, probably still lives there because she's married to kevin klein and they have kids and she's probably raising them there you kind of realize like she was a really fun actor and she hasn't made anything for years yeah and it's totally a choice yeah you know it's not i agree you know so kind of makes you go i wish she was still acting because she was a lot of fun yeah it's crazy because i did not think this movie's gonna hold up in it and i thought it did and i think it's it's kind of fucked up that it has such a low rating and i saw that like I think Siskel gave it the worst movie of 1991, I, I read in the trivia. I'm wow. Like, it's not that bad. There's definite flaws. But Definitely. It's got a good message. I think it, it was enjoyable to watch. Absolutely. Well, we thank you guys for listening, and we thank Taylor for letting us borrow her movie so yeah. we could watch it. Did you just crack your knuckle? I was holding my hand, and then when I like kind of pulled it away, my index finger popped a bunch of different times. Gross. Gross. Yeah. Social media. There you go. I had to That's think. I'm like, what do we do next? Uh, if you guys want to hit us up over on Instagram at Ruining Our Childhood. And Facebook also at Ruining Our Childhood. And over on Twitter at ROC Movie Podcast. Yeah. And we'll be probably putting up a poll. Not this week, but next week. So definitely check that out. Yeah. Also, um, when we put up the weekly notice about the episode and we put up there, if you guys have any suggestions for movies feel free to throw them in there yeah we're always looking for always looking for ideas because i'm we're really bad we'll be sitting here talking like Mm -hmm. right now recording a podcast and be like oh that movie oh it reminds me of that movie we should do that movie and then i when it comes to actually watching and recording this podcast it's like blank yeah we're like oh what are we gonna do this week even though on an episode two weeks ago we're like we should do that movie in a couple weeks and yes i write them down guys but that I don't always write them down. (laughs) (laughs) But next week, we have it planned out. Fantastic Four. Oh, yeah. That is what we're... (laughs) Did you forget what we're doing? (laughs) Yes. We're doing Fantastic Four, the 2005 classic. Classic. So that's what you guys can look forward to. Yes. 
I'm looking forward to Chris Evans. Mm, delicious. <laughs> anyway, guys, thanks for listening again, and we'll be back next week. Bye. Bye. I gotta hit the stop button.